This is a true story. It happened to a friend of a friend of mine, Jimmy. June 12, 1975 it was, when Jimmy learned he failed grade 10 for the fourth time. But he was not in a good mood for the high school disco dance. Still, he maintained a solid gold chain polyester packing delinquent in a cheap white suit persona in the face of adversity. And he sure could disco dance. Every girl in that high school fell in love with Jimmy when they saw him shooting his cuffs and strutting his stuff and the boys became real jealous. Especially Big Biff, the all-star fullback who turned into an ape on the dance floor. But then Biff's honey, Susie Q, cut in on Jimmy, who took Susie into his arms and lifted her over his head. The girls screamed, Susie beamed, and Biff belted Jimmy. Kapow! Jimmy fought back until the brawl was broken up by the vice principal. Of course, Jimmy got tossed from the dance and ended up thumbing his way home to the trailer park on the outskirts of town. And that's when it happened. At first, he thought he saw a car racing along Route 66. But then the headlights began to rotate and change color in a fast, hypnotic pattern. This was no ordinary car. It had no wheels. And just as Jimmy was registering this fact, he was hit with the light. He came to in the middle of exploding mirror balls, flashing plastic floors, and pulsating bass notes. Jimmy was in the disco of his dreams. At first, he was not real sure what happened. Standing in a flashing neon archway was Caramia. Her three cinnamon eyes flashing, chartreuse hair exploding in a gorgeous bouffant, and her light blue complexion accented with a bright splash of gold leaf eyeshadow. She was wearing six-inch purple platform shoes, and she needed them, since Caramia was barely three foot eight. For the first time in his life, Jimmy felt like a giant. Caramia winked her middle eye at him and sang, I'm glad you're here to meet and greet. You can tell by the way I move my feet. I need some help for this earthling beat. Can you teach me the hustle? That would be neat. Her parents brought Jimmy to their space station on the dark side of Mars to teach her to dance. Jimmy couldn't have been happier. He took Caramia out on the floor. They danced for a week and well, you know carbon-based life form teenagers are all pretty subject to emotional stuff. So it didn't take too long for Jimmy and Caramia to be going steady and talking about maybe even getting engaged. Caramia's parental centering units were highly advanced, but they were not prepared to let her marry him. So before you could say Zor Blag Zerob de Voof, Jimmy is laying in a ditch on Route 66. Did Jimmy tell his tale so everybody could laugh? No. Jimmy kept his mouth shut, got a crew cut, a library card, and before you knew it, he was topping the honor roll. He went to university on an Air Force scholarship, and by 25, James had a PhD in astrophysics and was a top-rated flyer, chosen to be the astronaut on Project Red Planet, the first manned deep space probe to Mars. The first 12 months in the Red Planet module were uneventful, but on February 14th, the RPM passed behind Mars. For three hours, there was no communication with the spaceship. When the module came out from behind the Red Planet, all that could be heard from the RPM was the soundtrack of Saturday Night Fever. And when the capsule splashed down to the South Pacific, the RPM was empty except for a pair of purple Paul Satan woman's platform shoes, size one. This was a true story. It happened to a friend of a friend of mine. And James, I guess he had a close encounter of the fourth kind, love. This is a true story. It happened to a friend of a friend of mine. Bobby was an army brat, so he kind of moved around a lot, all the time. New school, new town, new friends. But when he moved here, it was different. When Bobby did the first day at school thing, you know, looking lonely, not knowing who to talk to, a bunch of kids came over to help him. They were 10 years old, like Bobby, but they wore the baggy clothes like they thought it made them look real cool. But nobody else even gave Bobby a hello or anything. They say to Bobby that he has to pass some kind of initiation if he wants to be in whatever they think they are. Bobby says he'll do it. And they take him to the cemetery. 
They tell him a hundred years ago some old guy went berserk and got rid of his whole family. And even though he was guilty, he had to have a trial. But the people in the town got themselves all worked up, broke him out of jail and strung him up right from that tree. And they pointed to the tree next to Bobby. And they buried him right here. And they pointed to the grave next to the tree. And what Bobby had to do for his initiation was come back into the cemetery at the stroke of midnight and take a long, scary looking knife and jam it right into the dead man's grave. And Bobby says, sure, no problem. Well, it was one of those nights where the moon was low in the sky and the clouds whooshed across the sky so all the shadows were fluttering and moving. He was desperate to have friends, so he went for it. He got to the grave. He stood over it. The shadows seemed to be creeping up on him. And then he heard this real spooky kind of moan. It froze him. The moan got louder and wavier and weirder. It was like coming from the grave. Bobby figured it had to be the guys hiding behind the tombstone trying to scare him. Then, a big, dark cloud moved in and seemed to stop right in front of the moon. It got really, really dark. All he could see was the silhouette of the tombstone and a person. Maybe he wasn't sure what it was, but the howling was still going on. Bobby pulled up all the bravery his ten-year-old body could muster. He crouched down over the grave, pulled the knife out, and plunged it deep into the earth. He waited for something to happen, but it didn't. Huh? Nothing. Just hmm. silence. He could go now. He got up, but something grabbed his leg. Ah! He tried pulling away, but whatever it was held on. It, he, the thing, the ghost, whatever, was keeping him here at the grave. Bobby screamed the longest, loudest scream anyone ever heard. Ah! That's when the other kids came out of hiding. The dark cloud finally passed, and the cemetery was once again bathed in moonlight. Bobby was sure glad he wasn't alone. He started to tell the guys about the thing that grabbed him from the grave. They looked down and saw that when Bobby had plunged the knife into the earth, he stuck it into his pant leg and pinned himself to the ground. That was a true story. It happened to a friend of a friend of mine. Bobby. And a week later, he was back at the cemetery. Only this time, he was the one hiding behind the tombstone and howling. This is a true story. It happened to a friend of a friend of mine, Puddle, the shortest, scrawniest, puniest kid in our camp. If you got him laughing too hard, he'd piddle on himself. If you got him scared, he'd piddle on himself. If you hurt his feelings, oh, you guessed it. That's why we called him Puddle. Now back to our tent leader knew too. He thought it was hysterical when Puddle got scared and wet himself. Like on our last camping trip. We went up to the campgrounds near the old power station. We pitched our tents, made a fire, cooked hot dogs, and pretty soon it was dark. Time for campfire stories. So we all climbed into our sleeping bags and huddled around the fire. Baxter told a true story about a farmer. He used to own the land up where we were camping. The farmer once lost a cow. When it didn't come back from this very field, he followed his trail along the stream that ran by the power plant. Soon the farmer found himself waiting in the stream. It was getting darker, and he couldn't see anything except a strange glow near the power station. Soon there was a strange glow up ahead of him. It was his cow, floating towards him, dead and glowing an eerie yellow. The cow stopped against a steel grate just behind the power station. And on the grate was a big, radioactive warning sign. The farmer checked his watch, and as he rolled up his sleeve, his arm began to glow a yellow glow. He had become the Glow Monster. Baxter stuck out his hand in front of Puddle's face. His arm was covered in a yellow glow. Puddle screamed, Baxter laughed, and you can just guess what Puddle did. Right in his sleeping bag. Ah, 
Baxter told everyone to go to sleep, but we all wanted to know what happened to the farmer. Everybody except Puddle, who was trying to dry his sleeping bag over the fire. Baxter said he wandered the forests, ripping off the arms of campers and eating the glow-in-the-dark stuff from their watches. He disappeared into his tent, then called out and asked if anybody knew what time it was. We all went to look at our watches, but Puddle screamed, wet the fresh jeans he had just changed into. We decided it was better if we didn't look. Somewhere in the dark, we heard Baxter laughing. Around midnight, Baxter woke up to check the camp. He clomped around the campsite and began to realize he didn't hear anything. He checked the tents. There was nobody there. He found an old dried stream bed and followed it. He called the kids' names and started to get even nervous. Where were these kids? It's dark out here and there really did used to be a farmer who owned this land. And the power plant really did do some weird experiments years ago. Suddenly, Baxter turned the bend, and there, in front of him, was the grate, with the rusted-out radioactive warning sign. And there, about three feet off the ground, was a yellow glow, and it was moving towards him. Baxter froze. He knew then and there it was the farmer, the glow monster. Baxter ripped off his watch and held it out. Take it! Take it, he cried! Just, just leave it in my arms! A yellow hand reached out and took his watch. Then another glow appeared. except for the sound of water tinkling. Or was it piddling? All the light beams trained on Baxter, and then down to his feet. And then back to the the sound he dreaded most. The sound of his campers laughing, and Cuddle laughing the loudest. Hey, it's a true story. It happened to a friend of a friend of mine, Steve. We used to call him Puddle, but not anymore. We say that nickname for our camp leader. This is a true story. It happened to a friend of a friend of mine, Jerry. I guess he saw too many episodes of Space Space Mars, because sometimes you just gotta ask yourself, is it paranormal or am I just paranoid? He had this crazy idea there was a monster hiding everywhere. One evening, Jerry was taking his dog, Leonard, for a walk. When he went by that creepy old house on Mulberry Street, he peeked into the basement window. He wasn't a peeping Tom or nothing, but what he saw froze him dead in his tracks. The cellar was splattered in dripping, fresh blood. Suddenly, the door of the house opened. Jerry and Leonard ducked down in the bushes. The guy was dressed in a tuxedo and a black silk cape, just like in the movies. Jerry fell in the dirt when he realized this guy wasn't just a killer, he was a blood-sucking vampire. Jerry and Leonard crawled out and started trailing him. The vampire went down the hill, dragging his big old suitcase, but they lost him when he got on the Crosstown bus. Jerry could have gotten on with him, but dogs weren't allowed and Leonard was, well, a dog, so they went home. Next night, Jerry brought Mickey and Pete. Mickey borrowed his dad's camera. They were gonna get a picture of the vampire's butchering room. Then they'd be famous. Slowly, they made their way to the cellar window. The curtains were shut, but they heard this creepy, wet chopping sound. Something was going on in there, all right. A little while later, the door opened and the vampire stepped out, dragging his suitcase. Mickey was gonna take the guy's picture, but Jerry stopped him. Everyone knew that you couldn't take a picture of a vampire, they'd turn out invisible. Besides, the flash would give him away. The vampire walked down the hill. That's when Pete whispered, Hey, I know that guy. That's Mr. Alucard, the head waiter at that swanky restaurant across town. He's not a vampire. Everyone at that restaurant wears a tuxedo. Mickey was ticked. The guy's a waiter? You dragged me down here to get a picture of a waiter? It was getting late, so Mickey and Pete headed home. Some friends they were. He is a vampire! But the guys kept walking. 
Jerry hopped the next bus and got off outside the restaurant. It was getting late and Jerry didn't really have a plan, so he waved down a police car. The policeman asked him what he wanted. There's a maniac vampire in there! The police decided to check it out. Good evening. I bid you welcome. It was the vampire. That's him! Jerry flashed the vampire with his camera. The officers quieted him down so they could talk to the vampire, who answered all their questions. Of course, he wasn't really a vampire. He wore the tuxedo because he worked there. And he made the house specialty. Some sort of tomato juice from a secret recipe in his basement at home. Jerry told the men he was sorry and the police left. Mr. Alucard offered Jerry a glass of tomato juice. Jerry took a little sip. He sprayed the juice across the room. This ain't tomato juice. No, it's vegetable juice. Extra spicy. Jerry took another sip. You know, it's not bad. Then he finished his drink and went home. It's a true story. Happened to a friend of a friend of mine. Oh, yeah. Nikki's dad took the film in to get developed. When he got it back from the photo place, there was nobody in the picture.